this morning because you are good and your mercy and your forever. Blessed be your name for this great day. This is the day you have made. How we will rejoice and be glad in it. You are the iron and the ice, the richer than the richest, the stronger than the strongest, the wiser than the wisest, the holier than the holiest. We worship. I turn over this session to your hand this morning. Come and feed your children. Come and honor yourself. Come and glorify yourself. Come and magnify yourself. Thank you for joining this session this morning. Thank you for coming on board. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Sister Sandra, Pastor Yomi. Thank you, everyone. We have a very, very special time this morning to look into God's word. And uh, there is no better time to be thankful to God than this in this season. And I'm so glad to be alive. I'm so glad to be part of what God is doing in this end time and through different platforms from where we are giving thanks to God and from where we are bringing the word of the Lord. This morning's session is going to be very powerful. Please help me share this teaching, this broadcast on your timeline. We are looking at a very important topic, why the prayers of many Christians remain unanswered. Why the prayers of many Christians remain unanswered. Why the prayers of many Christians remain unanswered and how many of you want to get to a point in your life that everything you say in the place of prayers quietly or loudly you get answers to them i'm number one anything you say even if you just make a little guess or a little gesture or a little chuckle i just say something before you open your eyes, the answers are on your desk. Of course, the world will be sweet. Life will be sweet. Everything will be sweet. But let me tell you something this morning. As powerful as prayer is, as glorious as prayer is, as effective as prayer is, not everyone who prays gets answers to their prayers. And not all prayers will be answered. That is the scripture. And that is why as Christians and as pastors, if you are listening to me, you don't come on the altar and tell people that everything they ask God, God will give it to them. And that is a very wrong approach to prayer. Everything you say, God is going to stamp it. God is not a rubber stamp. He doesn't answer all prayers. And so that is the reason why some pastors and some preachers, they try to bring in their own human ideology and ingenuity and ask people to drop an offering so that they can get that answer to that prayer. Now, this is where we miss it. Like I tell people, when people give to God, it is God that rewards them. It is not your responsibility and my responsibility to tell God the kind of reward he will bring. So when people are giving God anything, give God a car, give God your time, give God your money, give God anything. Now, it is God that determines the kind of harvest. Now, you cannot guarantee that because somebody has given God money, God will reply him back with money. <laughs> that is, the Bible says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. The Bible did not say the exact thing you give shall be given unto you. So you can't tell people that anything they say, anything they do, God is going to reply back immediately with the same thing. 
And so this is some of these are some of the reasons why believers are led astray. And a lot of people get to a point where they begin to doubt God. Believers get to a point they develop rebellion against God. This thing is fake. No, prayer is not fake. God is a God that answers prayer. The Old and the New Testament are replete with abundant evidences of answers to prayer. Tangible, genuine answers to prayer. God has answered my prayers many times myself, but not all prayers. And to set this teaching in context, I'm going to read two verses of the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3, a very common passage of the scripture. Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3. God was speaking through Jeremiah and God said, Call unto me and I will answer and show you great and mighty things that you don't know. God is saying it. Oh, come unto me. That was in the Old Testament. And I can give you so many other examples in the New Testament where God is telling you and her, pray to me, come to me, I will answer your prayer. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 9, I'm going to read like four verses now. Deuteronomy chapter 9, I will read from verse 17 to 20. Listen to this scripture. Then I took the two tablets and threw them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first, forty days and forty nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin which you committed in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Verse 19. For I was afraid of the anger and out displeasure with which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me at that time also. Listen to that, 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 that statement. Moses was saying, the Lord listened to me. I prayed and the Lord listened. Profound scripture. I want my name to be penned down in heaven. That everything he asked for, the Lord listened to him. If you get your life to that level, if you get your walk with God to the level where everything you say, and it is possible, it is possible. Now, I said that God doesn't answer all prayer. That doesn't mean that when people pray, pray the right prayers one million times, God won't answer one million times. I'm going to get to that now. Moses said, the Lord listened. I underlined it in my Bible. The Lord listened to me at that time also. The last verse, verse 20, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 20. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him. So I prayed for Aaron also at that time. Now, Moses again prayed for Aaron and God changed his mind. That was in the Old Testament. Jesus had not come. The blood of the lamb had not been shed. People prayed to God. In the Old Testament, and God listened to them. Now, let me tell you some of the guys in the Bible, an example of some of them, who prayed to God. Now, before I go there, John chapter 14, verse 14 says, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And I have quoted Old Testament to us. Let's go to the New. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, I was in a meeting about four years ago, we are a Jewish, a Jewish scholar was leading a prayer session and he asked us to open to John 14, 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now the man said to us, that verse of the Bible in the original Greek, original Greek language reads like this. If you will indeed ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you will indeed, so you can be asking and not be asking indeed. To ask indeed means you ask genuinely, you ask passionately, you ask faithfully, you ask diligently, not flippantly. First John chapter 5, verse 14 says, This is the confidence that we have that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. According to his will. He hears us. Psalm 65 verse 2 says, O thou that hearest prayer, to you all flesh shall come. 
Oh, thou that hearest prayer. Now, he doesn't stop prayer. He hears prayer. He hears prayer. He hears prayer. Let me give you the, the example of five different people in the Old Testament. Or four of them. Four common examples of people who prayed to God. Jesus had not even come at that time and God answered their prayers. Elijah prayed, 1 Kings chapter 17. There shall be no rain. And again he prayed, there shall be rain in chapter 18. And God answered. Jesus had not come. Daniel prayed, Daniel chapter 2. And he asked God to reveal the secret of the king's dream to him. And God answered Daniel. Hannah prayed, 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 27. And Anna was in a desperate need for a baby. And Anna prayed passionately. God answered Daniel. Our Lord Jesus prayed for Lazarus. I mean, the examples are countless. John chapter 11. And Lazarus came forth. So, the God that we serve in this new dispensation, not just in the Old Testament, is a prayer asking God. But that is some that is that is a general knowledge. Ask anyone, they will tell you God answers prayer. It's, it's not something new. But that God answers prayers, does it mean God answers everyone's prayer? There are people who pray and they don't get answers and they get frustrated and they get lured out of their work with God and they get lured into all kinds of shady things. Now when you are praying for something, you are praying that your wife should have a child, your wife needs a child, you have been trusting God, you have been praying first year, second year, third year, fourth year, tenth year, fifteenth year, and you are not getting answers. No, you get frustrated. And when someone comes to you and offers you an alternative, there is one prophet somewhere, there is somebody somewhere, he doesn't even need to stress you. Just do this, do this, do this, you're going to have a baby. You will be tempted to do it, except you are well grounded in Christ. Delayed prayer. The Bible says hope that is delayed makes the heart sick. Hope that is delayed makes the heart sick. So when people are under extreme pressure and they are praying for something and they are praying for something and the answers are not coming, we get frustrated. When hopelessness sets in, Satan will fling alternatives to us. And the tendency of being defrayed, sorry, being, being de, 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 having a depleted faith in God is very high. I've given us the list of people who prayed and God answered. There were two people who prayed in the Bible. There are many of them, but two people who prayed and God didn't answer. One of them is Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 28 verse 6. The Bible says, and Saul inquired of the Lord, and God did not answer. By prophets, by Thurim, by Urim, God did not answer Saul. That was why Saul went to consult a witch, which is very instructive to us and our generation. If you are praying to God and God does not answer you, what will you do? <laughs> you die there. <laughs> you die there. Oh, he doesn't answer me. I don't care. I will find the solution elsewhere. You will find the solution elsewhere. You burn your fingers and then you come back to God to clean up the mess again. East or west, north or south, God will always win. The only fight you must never win is the fight with God. God is, you are praying for something and you are not getting an answer. You die there with God. You die there. <laughs> Why is he not answering me? Instead for Saul to go and make inquiry, to repent for his sins, to go and talk to any other prophet and plead with God. Saul did not. He looked for an alternative. God is sending me to someone. You're listening to me. You have been crying to God for something very important. You are at the brink of giving up. You are at the brink of consulting something else other than God. Don't do it. Don't do it. The problems and the crisis that your life will be exposed to will be worse than what you are going through now. I'm not scaring you. And I'm not. God loves you. God wants to answer your prayer. You just need to turn aside. Turn aside. When Moses saw the burning fire in Exodus chapter 2, the Bible says, chapter 3, Moses turned aside. When you are seeing mysterious things around your life, mysterious things, you are praying and praying and praying and praying, things are not happening. You need to turn aside. Something needs to change. Dr. Lillian Yeoman, Dr. Lillian Yeoman said something. He said, if I pray to God about anything, 
and I don't get an answer, then I know that something must change. And because I know that God does not change, I know that the change must come from me. <laughs> Dr. Lilia Human. If I pray about anything and God, and I don't get an answer, I, don't, I won't leave God. I won't go and look for an alternative. I will know that there must be a change somewhere. Since I know that God does not change, then the change must be with me. If God is not answering me, it's not God, it's me. <laughs> because God can never fail. God is constant. I am a variable. So if there is a problem and I'm praying, 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 no answer. It can't be from God. It must be from me. It must be my own circumstance that must change. God's circumstances are eternally constant. He never, he never changes. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. His circumstances are eternally constant. So if anybody will be a variable, it must be me. Instead for Saul to go and seek God, he turned aside. If you are listening to me and you have been knocking a door, the door refuses to open. Don't go to someone else to solve that problem for you. You are not here today by accident. I believe God brought you here. And I don't scare people. I have a commitment before God and a vow to God to tell people the absolute truth. Regardless of emotional attachment. Because everything I say, I will be judged by them. The Bible says every I do word that men shall speak, they will give account to God in heaven. So whatever I'm saying here this morning, I'm going to give an account to God. Another person, two people that pray to God. And God didn't answer them. Mark chapter 10, verse 36 to 39. Mark 10, 36 to 39. Two brothers, James and John, they came to Jesus. Their mother came to Jesus. I have a need. Jesus said, what was the need? Grant that my two children, James and John, sit on your right and on your left. Boy, anytime I read that scripture, I just shake my head. I say, God. I hope I am not in this picture. Let my two brothers, my two children sit down beside you. One on your left, one on your right. What did Jesus say? You don't know what you are asking. You don't know what you are asking. And I am putting this across to us this morning. Many of us are asking God for so many things. And God is saying, you don't know what you are asking. Jesus said, are you able to drink the cup that I am drinking? And are you able to be baptized with my baptism? They acted, they replied ignorantly. Yes, we are able. Jesus said, indeed, you will drink my cup. They sealed their destiny with their mouth. James and John. Eventually, James was, 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 was killed. Jesus said, even if you drink that cup, it is not mine to give to you. You don't know what you are asking. I want to sit on your right and your left. They were asking Jesus to give them something that Jesus had not paid for. Listen to these God's people. Sitting on God's left and on God's right side was a provision buried in the finished work of Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 says, He has made us to sit together with him. So as at the time they were asking Jesus, we want to sit on your left and on your right. Jesus had not died. He hadn't paid the price. So Jesus said, you don't know what you are asking. I, you can't just sit on my right and on my left. I have to die on the cross, shed my blood, and make it an open check for everyone. Anyone who gives his life to Christ will now be elevated to that position. What they were praying for at that time now became the benefit and blessings of the whole body of Christ now. We all are seated with Jesus now in the heavenly places. So they were asking Jesus for something that would eventually be theirs. But Jesus had not provided for it at that time. So he said to them, you don't know what you are asking. Which is my first point. If you ask God for something and you're not getting results, what are some of the factors responsible? Number one, you are asking what is not supposed to be yours at a particular time. Ephesians 2 verse 6. Ephesians 2 verse 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 said there is time for everything. To everything under heaven, there is a purpose, a time to die, a time to live. A time to mourn, 
a time to laugh. So you can be praying for something and it is not your time. Many years back, I wanted to travel out of Nigeria. And I was praying. Open the door. Open the door. Open the door. I, I applied for visa. They refused me three times. I was in my part one in the university. I had disconnected. <laughs> I had disconnected from Nigeria years ago. I said, the way things are going, I have to leave this country. If I stayed in this country, I can't tell you the story today. It's a very long story. And God said to me, you shall not go out with flights. You shall not. I said, what does that mean? And I checked other, other Bible verses and translations. Said, you are not going out in a hurry. God made sure that I finished my academic my pursuit. I served in Nigeria. I worked in Nigeria. I stayed back for another seven years after he gave me that word before the door to leave Nigeria opened. <laughs> now you are listening to me. You are angry with God because what you are asking for, he has not done it. And then you are at the brink of switching loyalty. This God is too slow. This God is too slow. No. God is not slow. The Bible says God is not slack in his promises. God is not slow. There is nothing God cannot give you in a twinkle of an eye. But because our God is a God that sees the end from the beginning, our eyes are limited. Many a times, we only see as far as our nose can permit. God sees as a 360 degree view of things. The consequences of the consequences of the result of the impact of one decision, 100 years from now, God has seen it ahead. So God will be positioning and repositioning. It's like a draft. And so that thing may not be good for you now. God is saying, wait a minute, my daughter. Wait. And that is why I always preach and tell people, you must be able to hear God. Because when you are praying and you cannot hear anything, sorry, you don't get an answer. Then you go and pray. It is in the place of prayer. God will tell you, wait. He will always speak. He is not a deaf and dumb God. He speaks and he hears. He will tell you, wait. He will tell you, wait. <laughs> my junior brother, my junior brother wanted to travel out of his base in Africa. I invited him, gave him a document, they refused his visa. I said, what is going on here? Second time we did it, they refused his visa. Then one of my family members said, I think there's a spiritual problem here. I think there's a demon. I said, I not called him. I said, don't try it. Don't even go that route. You have no demon pursuing you. If it is demonic, I will know. This case is not demonic. You are not ripe to get a visa. You have no job. You have no. Your account, your account statement is empty. They look at ties before they give visas to people. They look at ties. They want to be sure they're going to come back. You have no such thing now. Find a job. Settle down. Get married. Do some things. And he said, thank you, sir. Thank you to me. About a year or two after, he called me one day. He was at the embassy in Nigeria, at the U.S. embassy. And he was shouting on the phone. I said, what? He said, I got my visa. I said, what happened? He said, he got a job with a company. The company gave him an account statement. The company gave him money. They put up. And before we knew what was happening, he said, I didn't spend five minutes for the interview. I said, where are the demons pursuing you before? He started laughing. You are listening to me this morning. You are frustrated because what you have been praying for, you don't have answers today. God is telling me, wait on me. You may have a time issue there. And God always makes things beautiful in their time. By the time God solves that problem, you'll be thanking him for not solving it at that time. You wanted it to be solved. If I had left Nigeria, the time I wanted to leave, I won't be in ministry today. A lot of people have run ahead of God and have missed their destiny. That will be your portion in Jesus' name. You must not go ahead of God and you must not come behind God. That is the principle. You must always be in tandem with him. <laughs> A lot of people have run, they have run ahead. If I had left Nigeria at that time, I would not be a preacher today. I can bet it with you. I will not be. There is nothing God cannot do. <laughs> but in this context, I knew what I would have done. So God positioned the right people, the right mentors, the right environment. And he positioned it in his own time. 
They were literally begging me with visa. When I got my visa, <laughs> come, come and come and take it. Come and take it. To the glory of God. The most frustrating thing in your relationship with God and mine with God is to pray and not get an answer. That thing is very painful, particularly when you are in desperate need. When you are in a place where you have no one to help you, you are in the plane, you are in the ship, you are in the car, you are in, on the waters, you are in a shop, you are in a place. I have shared a story with you when I was almost embarrassed and ashamed inside a train. I saw the paid for my ticket. A woman I never knew in my life, a British woman. And you lift up your voice and say, Father, I need you to help me now. And God shows up. What a blessing. But sometimes we misinterpret scriptures. There are some verses of the Bible that when you read them, they appear as though they mean what they say without other contexts. For example, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, 14. A Jewish scholar in read that scripture Few years ago, I was in a meeting. He said the original Greek is if you will indeed ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, if you are not a disciplined, diligent student of the Bible, you if you will if you will, if you will ask anything in my name and you'll be praying for things, things are not happening. But you are not asking indeed. <laughs> to ask indeed means to ask diligently. Diligently. You are passionate about it. You are concentrated. You are focused. You are knocking. You are knocking, you are knocking, you are knocking. You are, there is a way a man can pray to God that it becomes impossible for God not to answer. Say, ah, I must answer my, my son. You are diligent. Sometimes, <laughs> like the man of God said, sometimes God loves to be waited upon. That sometimes he delays answers to our prayer because he's enjoying the waiting process. God wants his children to wait on him. So sometimes God deliberately delays the answer. So that it can provoke you to wait on him. So the longer you wait on him, you trust him, you worship him, it develops confidence in God that hmm, my son and my daughter really loves me. But if you are tapping your fingers, anytime you tap your fingers, you get the answer. You will not grow and mature. And you will transfer and translate that habit into every sphere of life. You will think you can just knock doors, knock doors, knock doors. And they're just going to be opening to you. So God sometimes delays those things to train his children. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you a second thing. We have spoken about time now. Number two, unconfessed or an altar of consistent life of sin. Now, let me make this clear. Let me make it clear. God is not a man. You make a mistake, he stops your prayer from being answered. You repent, then he asks us. Then he make a mistake, he stops it. That is not God. In this new dispensation, we are living by grace. However, there is a difference between making mistakes and regarding iniquity. The Bible says in the book of Psalms 66 verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. It didn't say if I commit iniquity. I am not promoting sin. Anyone who has hurt me by the grace of God knows I'm very, very hard on it. But what I'm saying is this. God does not carry a sledgehammer. Anytime you make a mistake, he hits your head. That is not the God of the New Testament. I cannot tell you that I have not made mistake today now or committed sin. No. What I'm saying is when a believer in Christ builds an altar of consistent life of sin, you know that what you are doing is wrong. You continuously do it. People are correcting you. You are saying no. I have to do it. Don't you know that I come from Southwest Nigeria? We are always very stubborn in my family. We don't take nonsense. You are proud. People are telling you you are very proud. You do it with impunity. You say it. You boast arrogantly about it. That is what it means to regard. You are regarding iniquity. You have built a house, a temple, doing the same thing consistently without any feeling. The Lord will not hear you. It means that this is not just a mistake. This is your lifestyle. So if you are listening to me and you have built any altar 
You could have made mistakes. When you repent, God will forgive you. You have built an altar in your life. An altar of any kind of thing, sin. You are permanently a corrupt person. You know that you are defrauding people. Anytime you do business, you defraud people. You have built houses. You have bought cars. You know that consistently. You made the mistakes. Oh, you wanted to get a visa. And then you lied and you got the visa and you repented. God has forgiven you. Move on. But now, lie is not consistent. You lie to your husband. You lie to your children. You lie to your boss. You lie to government. You lie on taxes. You lie to your church members. You lie, and you are doing it. People are correcting you. It is wrong. Say, no. No. You can't live in America without telling lies. This is not just a mistake now. You have built an altar. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the law will not hear me. That can block your prayers from being answered. It can. It can. Number three. If you are praying outside of God's will. James chapter four verse three. James chapter four verse three. You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss. Our generation, many people in our generation, many Christians, they don't pay attention to this. The will of God. Is there something like the will of God again? How long, how many times do you hear pastors preaching this? The will of God in marriage. Will of God in your career. No, we have put that at the back of the burner. We have elevated self. Egocentrism. Personal aggrandizement. And put God at the back. We have elevated culture above scripture. And there is always a clash between culture and scripture. Scripture is superior to culture. For example, a culture, a culture will tell you when someone does what is wrong to you, you have to reply and pay them back in their coin. The law of karma. The law of karma is not always consistent with the Bible. Now, scripture will tell you, bless your enemies, pray for your enemies. Now, you see a clash. So, there is a consistent clash between culture and scripture. You can't embrace culture. And at the same time, promote scripture. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you make the word of God of no effect because of your culture. So culture kills scripture. So you can't be a believer in Christ and you are embracing culture and scripture with both hands. And then you are pursuing the cultural inclinations of men while at the same time pursuing scripture. There is nothing called the will of God in culture. The way people behave in our society. In my family, we are all doctors. My dad is a doctor. My mom is a doctor. My brothers, are, they, are, they are doctors. I have to be a doctor because I want to sustain the family's name. And you know it in your heart that you have a calling into the music world or you have a calling into, into politics. And then you ignore that and you pursue medicine and surgery. You will make money, but you will be stunted. You can never be fulfilled until you find your place. You cannot be fulfilled. You will wear the best of clothes, drive the best of cars. You yourself will know in your heart that I don't like what I'm doing. I don't like what I'm doing. Can you imagine putting Usain Bolt inside a bag? The Usain Bolt that held the, the, the 100 meters uh, championship for, for like three, four years. And then you wear a suit and a tie and put him in a banking hall. You just want to kill him. So people are outside of God's will and they are praying. Now let me break this down. Let me break this down. Because this is a very important part. There are people that are in wrong locations. Wrong locations. The location that you are based has a lot to do with your entire destiny. As far as I'm concerned, more than 70, 80 or even 90% of success in life is determined by correct location. Look at every man that God blessed in the Bible. Abraham, get out of your location to another land and I will bless you. Isaac wanted to change location. God said, no, stay in this location. Genesis 26. If you go there, no, stay here. Jacob, God sent him out. Daniel, God sent him out. Joseph, God sent him out. Even Jesus was sent out at a particular time to Egypt. Location is strategic to destiny. So people are in wrong places and location 
can be anything marriage location business location geographical location spiritual location there are people listening to me they are in certain churches that church is a wrong location because the pastor of the church has sealed up the heavens of the people i'm a pastor i'm here about so many things there are pastors who go outside of god to get powers to build their church and they cast spare on the church members pray any prayer you are praying is your business pray any prayer pray and fast for one million years is your problem nothing will happen and until you meet someone who will be able to pray for you or counsel you and show you that you are in a wrong location you will be there for life your life will be disintegrating and degenerating so the matter of location is very strategic i don't play with it i don't play with it because once you are in a wrong location your allocation in life will not meet you there will not now i had the story of a pastor in nigeria now he buried something on his altar he buried something a sacrifice on his altar and then the instructions the pastor that shared this story is my friend so i'm not saying something i read in the book so what was the plan the people who gave this pastor the power they said to me you must always make people drop offering on your altar he said why anytime they are dropping offering they will bow down to drop the offering as they are bowing down they are paying homage to the idol on your altar so anytime it is offering time no ushers go around with offering basket everybody begin to dance forward dance forward now i am not saying this so that we'll be suspecting suspecting all pastors i'm not saying that. i'm not saying all pastors do that this particular man was doing it so people are coming out every time dropping offering dropping offering and as they're bowing down they are bowing down to the idol on the altar and from time to time the demon that is in that church picks people from the church for sacrifices people just die mysteriously people just get sacked from their places of work now if someone is a christian and is generally born again and is in that church he is in a demonic location there is no prayer you pray that will be answered until you are out of that environment i can tell you stories upon stories so the will of god is multi-dimensional as far as i'm concerned after you are in christ the next greatest will of god is your location location if you are supposed to be in america and you are in nigeria now so far so far <laughs> i have a a, a a cousin he said to me many years back he met a prophet and man told him if you read book like wale Shoinka in nigeria you have phd and you have a nobel laureate you will never prosper in this country until you go to go to go abroad oh no 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 i can prosper my father's land he suffered like he suffered like he will wear one cloth for three weeks he won't change it he suffered like as soon as he changed location everything turned around and it can be the other way around i know people who were drafted by god from the u.s back to africa they say go back home and they are loitering the streets of america and they are living in debt and they cannot point to one thing that they have achieved in 10 years i have people like that so a believer in christ must be very careful of this concept oh we are praying things are not working when you are praying 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 don't forget dr lily lily um lily humans words she said when i pray about anything and i don't get an answer then i know that there must be a change you have you are praying about things for three years six years six months there is no answer you can't keep praying i can't pray that, i can't pray for something for one week and i will keep praying the same prayer no i turn to prayer of inquiry say god what is going on because i don't want to spend 10 years and god will tell me you should have done this ah, very painful very very painful very very painful she said if i pray about anything and i don't get an answer then i know that there must be a change now since i know that god does not change then the change must be from me god is one god is eternal is in heaven he's strong doesn't change his location doesn't change if anything will change about my circumstance it has to be me and they begin to ask am i in the wrong location am i doing the wrong thing and there are many people they care less about what i'm saying 
they always look for shortcut and shortcut always cut people short instead of you to realign your life and get seamless effortless breakthrough because you have obeyed god and you have repositioned yourself no people will look for shortcuts go to a false prophet go somewhere and at the end of the day their journey will be longer in the wilderness because anything the devil gives you he will collect more people back from you he has no free gift location is a part of the will of god There are people who are in wrong marriages. That one is that one is severe. <laughs> I have done a whole session. I have done a whole session on this one. I call some marriages the graveyard of destiny. Graveyard of destiny. Once you marry that woman, your destiny padlocked. You're finished. Once you marry that man, your destiny padlocked. And you can't divorce the man because you don't have any biblical basis. It's not into adultery. It doesn't beat you. But it padlock your destiny. You cannot do anything. I have this proposal. No. I have this project. No. It is just me. 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 Selfishness is the number one killer in marriage. A research was conducted in America years back. And they were interviewing divorced couples. And they ask them, tell us the most important reason, the most important factor for your divorce. Why did you leave your wife or your husband? They polled like 25,000 divorce couples. Top on the list, selfishness. Not immorality. The researchers were surprised. Ah, they thought the couples would say, he, he, she was unfaithful to me. She was in, in, in adultery. No. So even if she committed adultery and it was an error, a mistake. I would have forgiven him or her. But he is a very selfish man. A very selfish man. Selfishness is me, myself, my career, my parents, my children, sorry, my career, my books, my car, my money, me, myself, and I. I, me, I, me, I, me, I, me. Once one of the party come, begin to suspect that this man cares less about me, it is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when the marriage will break down, except there is a serious intervention. Serious intervention. Which brings me to the next point. And I'm speaking to men now. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Let me read a scripture to us here. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Listen to this. <laughs> I don't want men to be angry with me. My marriage teachings are always very balanced. Very balanced. I don't support anybody. I support principles. I don't preach issue-based marriage uh, teaching. I do principle-based. There's a difference between issue-based marriage seminar and principle-based. Because you, you, you preach on issues. issues, issues are different. Make it principle based. Listen to this. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, listen, husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. <laughs> honor your wife. That your prayers may not be hindered or blocked. I am not a biased married counselor. I am not. I focus on principles, not on issues. My prayers are not answered. You're, you are a man listening to me. Maybe you are dishonoring your wife. I didn't say you are worshipping your wife now. And this is you should worship your wife and adore her and deify her and worship her. No, the Bible is speaking to honor. Honor your wife. Now you talk her down, you sh shout her down, you body shame her. See yourself. See, I married you when you were size this. You are you are good for nothing. 
if they want to give awards to the dirtiest woman in the whole of America, you will win the award. You are so useless. Right in the presence of your friends, you drag her down. You shout at her. Her career is on the last portion of the burner. It is about you. From BSc to MSc. From MSc to PhD. After PhD, I'm going to Harvard. Oh, sweetheart, I want to do a one-week course online. No, 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 no. Just take care of my children. Do you want money? It's not about money alone. And you are dishonoring her. And you will know. If you are born again, you will know. <laughs> I, do, I didn't know. No, you will know. That is dishonesty. And you will know. The spirit of God is inside you. You've got a conscience. If you are in Christ, you will know. The Bible says you are dishonoring your wife. Your prayers will be in that. There is no amount of seed you can give that can get your prayer answered. If your wife is a piece of shit, it will not be answered. Except you go to the devil to get that prayer answered. And you know Satan gives people a head. He gives them cap and he takes their head sometimes. Not even sometimes, every time. And God has asked me to speak to men. There is no marriage that is free of challenges. But don't dishonor your wife. Don't dishonor your wife. Don't dishonor her. I was teaching on the radio in Nigeria about a month ago. And I said to them, I know that will be very strange to many men. Not all Nigerian men now, but many men in Nigeria. Not all of them. I said, the wife is not the inferior gender. The male and the female gender are equal in value and in worth before God. However, they are different in roles and responsibility. They are different. One is the head. One is the supporter of the head. Like the helper of the head. <laughs> and so, she is not the inferior gender that should be shouted on, talked down, humiliated, despised, vilified. You can't be vilifying your wife, discrediting her, insulting her. And this speaks to what I have been saying all this time. A lot of people who are in marriages, Christian husbands who are in marriages are not born again. Like we have millions of women who are not born again. But they have a form of godliness. But they are denied the power. So when you have a form of God, you look religious. You can sing Christian songs. You dress in a Christian way. You talk Christian languages. Bro, sis, I do those things. That is not transformation. That is just decoration. <laughs> and a lot of people are decorated to hell. Decorated Christianity, they have the form, they are not saved, they are not saved. So, you cannot claim to be a believer in Christ and you are saying to your wife, Are you mad? That is, I have never in my life, 13 years of marriage, use a vulgar word for my wife, not one day. And God is my witness, not one day. Are you stupid? It has never. Have I not been angry several times? I've not been very, very angry that I would pick the key of my car, drive out of the house and go and stay somewhere and stay there for three hours. And I'll go and buy a bottle of very cold drink. By the time I drink it and I relax, my brain will come back and reset. Are you a mad woman? Useless. It has never. You can send her, a, send her a private message and ask her. So anywhere I go, by the grace of God, I have the confidence of Christ. Not by my power. To the glory of God. That you cannot tell me that because of challenges in your marriage, you can't control your mouth. No, you can't control your mouth. I am controlling my own by the help of the Holy Spirit. You too have the same Holy Spirit. You have to control it. There is no amount of anger. No matter how angry I am. I have never pushed that one day. I have never charged. No, you charge at a woman. You stand up on your seat and charge at her. Not one day. When the anger in me comes up and I'm angry, I just go to my office. Or I just keep quiet. That is called self-control. It is a fruit of the spirit. Pastors should emphasize this kind of things. These are the things that are blocking people from getting answers to their prayer. And then you are you get your point. Say, my pastor doesn't get have anointing. This church is a useless church. I've been here for 20 years because you are deceiving the pastor. The pastor sees you as a good man or a good woman, but when you leave the church, you get home, you become something else. 
and you can deceive man, you can't deceive God. You can't deceive God. You can deceive man, you can't deceive God. I had the story of a couple yesterday. The pastor of a church in Nigeria. Himself and the wife, they will wear similar clothes, the same color, the same brand. Sit down together in church. The cameraman will even come there and take their picture. They love the display. Oh, mama. Oh, papa. Oh. As soon as they come out of the church, they enter their car. The driver said, the man will be yelling, are you mad? Are you crazy? How dare you do this in the church? I will withdraw your car. I will withdraw the car I gave your parents. I will stop the monthly bonus I'm giving them. Useless woman. The driver now went to report them to another pastor in Nigeria. What kind of people are these? When they enter church, everybody says, Daddy, Daddy, Papa, Mama. And so you are praying, you are praying, and the prayers are not answered. Maybe you are the one blocking your prayers. This is not my word. First Peter 3 verse 7. Honor your wife so that your prayer will not be answered. I mean, in that. The Bible is not saying that the wife will not make mistakes. The wife make, women make so many mistakes. Men too make so many mistakes. So it's not about deity. Find her, turn her to a deity, to a, an idol. And she does what is wrong, you can't correct her. There is a way you correct your wife without insulting her. There is a way you correct your wife without insulting her. I swear that this thing is wrong. What you've done is wrong. And she flares up. What do you mean? What do you mean? No, let me explain what I'm saying. You cannot talk to my mom like that. My mom is like your mom too. It is very wrong. That is one way of saying it. The other way is this. You, come here. Do you think you're in your right senses? How dare you talk to my mom like that? How dare you in your right thinking? If you are trained by your parents, if your parent trains you very well, or maybe they train you, you didn't wait to collect full training. You were trained, you are supposed to go on a six-month syllabus. You collected two months. Maybe, are you sick upstairs? The day you talk to my mom again, I will show you that I am the head of this house. <laughs> In my language, they will say, when you tell somebody, sorry, there is a male dimension of sorry. There is a female dimension of sorry. <laughs> I don't want to say the Yoruba language. <laughs> I'm emphasizing this part because of myself and so many other men. Because I myself, I'm still learning. Because as, as men, sometimes our hair go affect us. And then you insult the woman. You shout her out, shout out down. You humiliate her. You dress her down. You strip her of honor, dignity. You turn her to less human. You superimpose your own plans and purposes. Our career is worthless. And you are a man listening to me and you are praying. The Bible says your prayers may not be answered. No, a lot of men wouldn't like what I'm saying, but that's the truth. And I am not preaching to attract crowd. I don't preach to attract crowd. I preach to be faithful. I don't preach to attract crowd. Because I know that God doesn't reward crowd. You can have one billion people on your platform. It's a, it's a waste of time. <laughs> it's a waste of statistics. It is... <laughs> well done, thou good and faithful servant. God rewards faithfulness, not crowd. Not crowdfulness. Faith, how have you taught them? Did you teach the truth? Without fear or favor. Did you do what I asked you to do? Did you add to it? Did you take a, those are the things God reward? So I'm not bothered about people like me, don't like me. <laughs> I just come and hit the word, roll like that, and I leave the rest to the Holy Spirit to solve. Another reason why people's prayers are not answered is this you are praying to a God. You have no relationship with. John 15 verse 7 says, listen to this. John 15 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatsoever you want, it shall be done. Now, it is a two-legged equation. You abide in me. You are in Christ, you are born again. 
and my works are bad. That speaks to the fact that you can be in Christ and Christ is not fully abiding in you. It is very possible. You can be born again genuinely, but the works of Christ are not dwelling in you. They are not dwelling in you. And that is the, 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 the case of many Christians. So we have a lot of carnal believers who are very much like unbelievers. And you're asking, is this man born again at all? Yes, he's born again, but he's abiding in Christ. The works are not abiding. You can genuinely be in Christ. You are born again genuinely. You love Jesus. But his words mean nothing to you. It is when those two conditions are met that you will now ask God anything and it will be done. He said, if you abide in me and my word, not if you abide in me, you will ask what you will. No, that is wrong, wrong scripture. He said, if you abide, number one, and my words abide, number two. So what are his words? You love people. You are a man of truth, a woman of truth. You are faithful. You are humble. You, are, you, 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 you have self-control. All the words, you are not rationalizing scripture. You are not saying this is Old Testament. Or when you read Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all my needs. You receive it. You like it. When you read, oh, mongers and adulterers, God will judge. Say, so, no, 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 no. Paul was writing to the Ephesians at that time. Time. Let us contextualize it now to our time. That was old, that was the time of Paul. No, no. The Bible says whole scriptures is given, not some scriptures. Whole scriptures, A A L L. Whole scriptures is given, is given, is given. All for instruction, for doctrine, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished. Unto every good works, all scripture, not some scripture, not a thought. So you don't compartmentalize the Bible and break it into sections. This one refers to particularly the New Testament scriptures. So if you are not in Christ, your case is even worse. Now you are in Christ, and these words are not abiding in you. It will affect your prayer life. That is why many Christians are praying for things, and they are going, they are getting no answers. And they are getting frustrated. I will leave this Jesus. This Jesus is not sweet. I read the story of a lady who was a Christian. I believe she was born again. Maybe not. I'm not sure, but she said she was a Christian. But now she's a Muslim. And she was complaining. I don't like this Christianity. This, I said, you didn't receive the correct Jesus. I said, you cannot taste honey. And you still retain bread. <laughs> I said, if you taste the correct Jesus... There is nothing in this world that can take him from your hands. The Bible says, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall this, shall that, what is present, what is to come? Yea, in all these things, if you receive the correct Jesus and somebody is giving you something else, say, oh, I have the original. Oh, keep your fake. Keep your fake. If you are in Christ Jesus, your his words must also be in you. When his words are in you, and then you get to a point in your life, anything you ask, he says he's going to do it. Because you are not just in him, he himself is in you. I'm going to give us another one. Sometimes demonic operations can block prayers from being answered. You, you, you better believe that. <laughs> you better believe that. Paul said, a great and effectual door was opened to me, but there were many adversaries. Who opened that door? Of course, God. Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So, you can be praying, and the prayers we are praying sometimes satanic demonic agents can interfere the answers they can very possible there was a time jesus took jesus took three apostles peter james and john took them to the mount of transfiguration matthew 17 verse 21 when he was coming down he met a man who brought his son to his apostles and they were praying they were praying the demon did not leave that boy. Jesus said something very profound. Jesus said, This kind will not go except by prayer and fasting. In other words, you are praying for something that has a dimension of demonic operation that will not go easily. You have to apply the force of fasting 
and hammer it, not just prayer. So if you are a mature Christian, there are issues of life that will not bow down easily. You are praying and praying. There are demons in cities. There are territorial demons over nations. There are demons. Every nation on earth has gates. America has gates. Britain has gates. Nigeria has gates. There is the Prince of Persia. Demonic agents over cities and nations. Because Satan is the God of this world. John 14 verse 30. Jesus said, The prince of this world cometh and finds nothing in me. Jesus himself acknowledges that Satan is the prince of this world. So Satan has gates across all nations. So sometimes those demons, they see that you are praying. You want to pull down your kingdom. You are a pastor. You are into business. You want to get into a particular sphere of influence. You want to get a license to operate a TV station. And you are a Christian. They know that you will bring the values of Christ to the media world. Satan will enter someone who will block it. They will not approve that license. We all have gone through it. You are applying for a program, for a license, for a certificate, and things are what is going on here. Because the enemy has seen that this man, if he becomes the director, he is a Christian, he will flush me out of this place. Jesus said, this kind, you can't get answers to this prayer, to this kind of request easily. You have to hammer it very well. There are these kinds of financial problems. There are these kinds of marital crisis. There are these kinds of sicknesses. Jesus said it. So you don't, you don't commonize and put all issues of life on the same platform. Because issues of life come in different shapes and grades. Once you see that you are on the same spot, on the same situation, and it is lingering, it is lingering, six months, one year, you are praying the normal prayer, 10, 10 minutes prayer about it, and you are not getting results. You will switch on to the next gear. No, you hammer it, 30 minutes, one hour, and then you hammer it with fasting. And when it gets to a point, you are not hearing anything, go and pray the prayer of inquiry. That was what Elizabeth did. <laughs> So if all is well, why am I like this? There was struggle in her life. If all is well, why am I like this? You ask God that question. Why is my life like this? If, if she wasn't saying, this is my plan, God, stamp my plan. Say, so if all is well, and God said, two nations are in your womb, two manners of people shall be separated from your body. A people shall be greater than the other people. That was what brought comfort. Yo, I am carrying Jacob and Esau. That is the reason why I am carrying nations. Some of you, you are carrying nations. It is because you want to give back to nations. That is why there is struggle in your life. And you are wondering, why is my life so tough like this? No, you are carrying nations. The kind of glory that you are going to give back to is not ordinary. It is not ordinary. And the Bible says, who has seen such thing? Who has had such a report? Shall a nation be born at once? Shall the earth be made to give back in one day? For as soon as Zion travails, she brought forth her children. Will I bring to the time of birth and not cause to deliver? Will I cause to deliver and shut the womb? As soon as Zion travails, she brought forth her children. Isaiah 66 from verse, verse 5 to the end. To verse, verse 13, verse 14. So when you see travail around you and struggle for a protracted period of time, very long period of time, and you have prayed, you have fasted, hmm, you are carrying a heavy duty. There are some people, the baby in their womb is the next president of a nation. You are carrying the next prophet. There are people that are carrying a dimension of glory. There are different realms of glory. The Bible says, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the star. Even among stars, stars differ from stars in glory. There are different levels of glory. So you may be praying and praying and there are no answers. It may be that you are about to give birth to a territorial glory, intercontinental glory, a glory that is transgenerational, something that no one in your family has ever given back to. 
in that instance, God will prepare you very well and will take you through furnace. You can pray for that thing for 20 years. But when that glory is born, hey, the old world we know, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. When the three wise men, so when the wise men saw the star of Jesus, they said someone had just been born. Go and ask God question. Pray about it. If you get to a point where you have done everything I'm saying, you honor your wife, you are in Christ, Christ works and in you, you are in the right location, you are praying very well, you are working with God, you don't have any unconfessed sin in your life, and still you are praying a legitimate prayer, and you don't have any answer to it. Hmm. You may be set up by God to bring forth glory unique glory, territorial glory, intercontinental glory. I have had that experience before. <laughs> I have had that experience before. I went through series of trouble and trials. Prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Nothing happened. I prayed for the same thing for 15 months. 15 months, nothing happened. Both prayer by fasting, prayer by whatever. And I went to pray one day. I said, God, I am, I've had enough. What is going on here? Huh. God said, he's about to launch me into a new realm. And the realm is going to open a door that will reach the old world. I said, what are you saying? I was looking for crumbs. God was thinking about some of you. God has raised you up to be employers of labor. And then they are sucking you, sucking you, and you are angry with God. I shared a story with you a few weeks ago, two weeks ago. When I was in the UK, many years back, I was doing a particular job. My salary was 400 pounds per month. 400 pounds. My rent was 300 pounds. I have, I will have 100 pounds remaining. I will, I will pay my cable TV. I will pay for my phone. We will buy groceries, like 40 pounds grocery. And that 40 pounds grocery was a lot of money. I would have like 10 pounds with me. And I, they, there was a day they wanted to sack me. They gave me a letter of query that they're going to do an investigation. I did something that was wrong and they would fire me. And I called my wife. And we were praying and praying and agreeing. I was praying, God, please. Ah, this is trouble. Ah, my job, my job, 400 pounds job a month. God did not answer that prayer. God said, no, no. I'm taking you beyond this level. I'm bringing forth a new glory in you. It was one year after that experience that I got two offers as a consultant with two companies in the UK. In one of those companies, I made 100,000 pounds working for them. 100,000 pounds. In one of those companies. One, not the second one. One. 100,000 pounds, 400 pounds. 100,000 pounds, 400 pounds. And I nearly died before God. Breaking the door. Forcing the prayer. 15 months. <laughs> so you may be carrying unique glory. God wants to use you to raise up, to, 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 to be a blessing to one million widows. God wants you to bring forth a unique business idea that will change the whole world and you'll be feeding people you'll be housing people you'll be feeding the elderly and you are still in that employment and you are god let them promote me let them promote me and they are not promoting you go and pray and ask god go and pray and ask god you may even be the one sitting on top of your glory and god is saying you better get out of this place you better get out of this place there is nothing more devastating for a man than for his present to be the enemy of his future. There is nothing more devastating in life than for a man's present to be the enemy of his future. <laughs> nothing more devastating. You are holding tightly to that thing and God is saying let go and let God. Jacob left his father's house with one staff. 
and he was saying to God when he was praying, he said, I left with one staff. Now I have become a company of many people. One staff. And I'm speaking prophetically to someone. You're listening to me. You're holding one staff in your hand. It appears like nothing. That staff, that rod in your hand, that is what God wants to use to take you to your next level. Praise the Lord. I went to I went to a country. I wanted to go to the UK many many years back. That's about 20 years ago now. I applied for visa. First time they refused. Second time they refused. Third time they refused. And I went to and I when they refused the second time, the third time, I got a lawyer and I said, okay, let me apply for appeal. So I applied for my appeal and I packed my bag and I went to South Africa. South, South Africa. After one, two, three, four, five, six months, seven months, I didn't hear back from them. So I knew that the appeal would not be granted because they refused the visa based on, oh, you, you won't come back to Nigeria, whatever. I just submitted the appeal. So I go to South Africa. I worked as a consultant for a mining company there and and I just entered and I wanted them to renew the job. They didn't renew it. I did everything possible. I went to speak to the head office people. They said no. So I was with that job. Ah, and problem began. Things were so bad that I was living in only one room. The room was like a quarter of a room. <laughs> to walk out of my room, because of where the small bed is, I had to squeeze myself out because the owner of the house just barricaded, just barricaded a particular space and rented it out. Ah, I said, God, what kind of a life is this? I will do interview with every every notable company I knew in that country. Oh, you have a very fantastic resume. They won't give me the job. After I had suffered for like one year, I went to pray. I had been praying along the way, but I went to pray seriously. And I said, God, and God said, no, you are not staying in this country. I'm moving. This is not your Canaan. And another man of God sent me a message. He said, the Lord asked me to tell you, I'm about to do something great in your life. I said, I will lay upon. I wanted to stay in that country. I love that place. I will see my friends who are walking, who are driving brand new cars. I said, wow, what test do, that, do, 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 do I want? God was seeing ministry. God was seeing a leader in future. That no, this man can't stay in this country. And I held tightly to it. One day I said, God, I am letting go. And God said, wait and see what I will do. So, to cut the long story short, one day I was in my room, around 10 p.m. at night, I got a text message from a pastor. He said, I saw a revelation about you. A door is about to open. I just smiled. No, you are in a condition of of despondency and hopelessness and someone is telling you a big door somewhere it's like very abstract I said, what are you saying i said well sometimes to hit in a day was a problem it was very bad and i cannot beg <laughs> it made it worse i just got a message an email and it came from the british embassy <laughs> And no, 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 no. I got a call from Nigeria, and somebody said, The British Embassy in Nigeria, they're looking for me. I said, For me, he said, You remember, you applied for a visa two years ago, and they refused. They said they will give you the visa now. I said, Forget about all these karma scammers have come. I just dismissed it. I said, Two years before, you are just. But the following morning, I went to a cafe and I sent an email. I sat for the UK Embassy's uh, um, email address. So I, I wrote him an email and said, I got a call from Nigeria. I know that this is a scam, but this is my name. This is my passport number. Is it true that the visa you refused two years ago, you have approved it again? I knew in my heart that what I was asking was foolish. How can you refuse the visa two years ago? And now they are approving it after two years. I just smiled. The second day, I saw a reply. You know, when you open your email and you saw re, and then your, the title of your message, I didn't open it. It was dark colored. I said, ah, I know them. When I opened it, 
facts there sir yes it is true we have reconsidered your re, re, your the visa refused you two years ago can you come with your passport and pick up a visa i nearly fainted i nearly fainted what is going on here before i know what's happening i was back to nigeria i went to that when i was in the embassy i said no this is still a dream when they called me into the room and they asked me for my passport i thought they would say oh it's a mix-up i didn't tell anybody because i said no this is a scam how can you refuse visa two years ago and now they approve it now they approve the visa the same week before the friday of that week i got a call again from me i got a from a university in the uk you applied for a program in the uk and uh, we are approving a scholarship for you they approved a scholarship for me for an mba program I go to the UK. Oh, we run that there is a program in France, and they are taking people there for for training. You are among selected. They carry me to France B within one year before I knew what was happening. All the things that I lost, God restored everything in multiple fold. God restored everything in multiple fold because I let go of what I was holding tightly. You are praying and fasting and praying and fasting on the same thing. God is asking me to tell you this morning. Maybe a new glory is about to be born through you. Maybe you are in a wrong location. Maybe you are in a wrong environment. The number one enemy of the future is the present. Is the present. Finally, this morning, there are times that we are misapplying prayer for something that does not require prayer. The Holy Spirit will not let me go until I say this this morning. John chapter 5, Jesus got to the pool of Bethesda, pool of Bethesda, and he saw a man there, and just asked the man, would thou be made O? The man said, an angel will come and then they will stir the waters and whosoever first enter that water. And while I am going, another man steps before me. Powerful statement. No one will take your place in Jesus' name. <laughs> while I am going, another step it before me. That is the problem of some people. No, they are never forced. It's a serious problem. <laughs> Why I am going, another, why must it be another, not me? But the condition was this, whosoever stepped first into the water, not whosoever entered the water now. It's not entering the water at your own time. Whosoever enter first. The day the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to that scripture, he said that is speaking to excellence, being number one. Now there are people who are number last, and then they are praying to God to give them the job of number one which is some of the crisis we have in the body of Christ, particularly in Africa. Someone who is poor, who is tardy, who is tattered, who is inefficient, who is sluggish. Now, you want God to give you the position of number one. And we misapply scripture. The first shall be the last. Last shall be the first. That was not the context in which that scripture was written. You cannot deliberately, intentionally, wholeheartedly decide to be number last and ask God to give you the job of number one. There is a place in America, Silicon Valley. Some of the brightest minds in the world are working there. If you are praying about what you have the capacity to achieve, God will not answer. AI is a scholarship program. You are applying for that scholarship program. And they desire, they demand a 2-1 minimum of first class. And you have a 2-2. And you, you put in your best. And that best got you a 2-2. Then the favor of God cannot walk in. And you can pray and ask God for favor. But that will not be your normal lifestyle. Now you're supposed to prepare a proposal and submit it for a contract. And you do it shabbily. Errors. I, I was to recruit people in Nigeria. I've shared this story many times. I set up a research company about four years ago or thereabouts. And I wanted to recruit people to work with me as a freelance researcher. 
and I put up an advert in a Nigerian newspaper and I got 500 resumes sent to me within a week or thereabout. And I was to screen those resumes myself. Come and see PhD holders. That was when I knew that ah, Nigeria has a big problem. PhD holders, two master's degree holders, what is going on here? Looking for jobs. And I read through the resume. More than 70% of the resume, I didn't even read. Once I saw the presentation, I trashed it. Somebody will write a resume and everything will be black. We will be bolding all the words, all the letters. Some will use capital letters from A to Z, everything capital. And you see master's degree, University of Patakot, University of whatever, Lagos or whatever, Ibadan, whatever. I screened those ones out. The remaining hundred grammatical errors, I screened them out until I got like 20. So those 20, I will give them, give them assignments. I will tell them, do this research work for me. Investigate this subject. Go online, search for information, submit it tomorrow by 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Make sure you proofread your work. I will give them the option. Go to review or, or, or whatever on Microsoft Word and spell and grammar check or use spell check or use whatever. They will say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Submit tomorrow, Monday, by 2 p.m. Say, yes, sir. By 1.45, tomorrow morning, I will receive it. 1.50, I will receive it. 2 p.m., I will receive it. 2.05, I will receive it. I will not get my phone or an email. Where is the document I asked you to prepare? Uh, actually, there was no light. And I was thinking of telling you, but uh, I, I was still thinking that if I can manage myself, and I, 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 let me start on it now. Let me start. I promise you by tomorrow, if you come, my head will be like spinning. I say, what is going on here? Ah, these are reports that a client somewhere is waiting to collect from me by 3 p.m. or by 2.30 p.m. I started firing them from 20 to 15, 15 to 10, 10 to 8, 8 to 14, 2 remained. 2. <laughs> you know what happened? I just woke up one morning and I got an email. The company I was working with, who gave me that contract, they canceled the contract. They said there were so many discrepancies so many delays i took the responsibility as the leader and i fired the remaining two person come and see emails in my inbox people begging me i need a job these same people were coming back for me i need a job and i shook my head i said these guys will be praying and fasting every day they were very 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 poor excellence does not take the place of prayer Prayer does not take the place of excellence. If you are not excellent and you are praying, that prayer will not be answered, particularly if the power to become excellent is in your hand. If you don't study, you don't prepare, you don't plan, you don't dress well, you insult people, you are tardy, you are shabby, you do, and you are praying to get a good wife or a husband to marry you, you will only attract your time. You will only attract your time. These are some of the areas where we may supply prayers. And the Lord asked me to tell us that you do your best. One day God told me, I will never do for you what you can do for yourself. I will never do for you. Prayers come in handy when you have reached your limit. You are praying for things you cannot do yourself. That is one of the, one of the principal problems facing the African community. A lot of people praying to God for something that they can do themselves. And so prayers remain unanswered. People are flooding churches. Scammers are scamming Christians. Prophets are coming. Show your car, show your house for something that your own diligence and excellence would have resolved. Would have resolved. It is when your hands are down, your backs have hit the wall. Say, God, help me. And God is very, 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 very faithful. The Bible says God is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Second Samuel chapter 3, verse 2. When he looks at every man, looks in your heart. See, this man is a lazy man. Ole, ole, nye. <laughs> you are a lazy man. You spend 18 hours on social media, 30 minutes on your book, and then you are praying for wisdom to pass your exam. Go and study. 
And this is what God has asked me to give us this morning. Why the prayers of many Christians remain unanswered? Please help me share this teaching. It's going to bless someone. This is a time. There is no time. There is no better time to be more prayerful than now. But not just praying any kind of prayer. Pray when your face is covered and you are shooting your gun. Is being is working aimlessly. You don't want to go to a battlefront and you are shooting your gun like this. The American military they have drones, drones that they have installed in the space. For what? Because they want to have accurate information. They want to see the enemy, the location of the enemy, the geography of the enemy, the topography of the enemy, before they launch their missile. If you are ignorant, you are tardy, you are careless, you are not clean, you are dirty, you dress any out, insult people, talk any out, you are in wrong location, you dishonor your wife, you are not in Christ. All these factors in there in your life, and you are praying, 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 praying. You are like a man who covers his head, his eyes with a cloth, and they drop you in an enemy's camp, and they give you a gun. The enemies will just be clapping for you. <laughs> and God has asked me to tell us this morning, he's a God that answers prayer. Jeremiah 33 verse 3, call unto me, and I will answer, and show you great and mighty things. That you don't know. He wants to answer prayer. Psalm 65 verse 2. Oh thou that hearest prayers. Unto you shall all flesh come. He doesn't stop prayers. He hears them. It is his joy and delight to hear them. Mark 11 24. What things soever you desire. When you pray. Believe that you receive them. And you shall have them. John 14 14. If you will ask anything in my name. In the original Greek it is. If you will indeed ask anything in my name. Indeed. You ask it sincerely. You are not asking what you can do for yourself. You didn't just finish beating your wife and you are praying. You just finished cursing your wife and you are praying. You just finished cursing your husband. Ah, your life will be worse than your parents' life. You are a useless man. You are a wicked man. It will be not, and you don't go to pray as a woman. You are just deceiving yourself. If I regard iniquity in, your, in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Getting answers to prayer is cheap to God. So while they are still answer, I will do it. Before they speak, I will perform it. How will my son be finding it hard to ask me for something? It is the joy of every father to give his children what they want. My son doesn't have to fight and kick and yell and jump and roll to ask him for food, for clothes, to pay his tuition fees. I feel irresponsible as a father. When my son is whining, Daddy, please give me food. Give me food now. Daddy, please give me clothes. Daddy, pay my tuition fees. I feel irresponsible. I will even feel angry with him. I will say, keep quiet there. <laughs> That is the way many Christians behave. It is when a son has misbehaved. Your parent gave you an instruction. You refuse to do it. You dishonor your parents. And then you now say, Daddy, I want you to buy me a basketball. You say, get out of my, of my, of my sight now. <laughs> and I believe God has spoken to us this morning. And I'm bringing this decision to a close. And I want to welcome us into a new week starting from today. Please help me share this teaching. And it's going to bless someone, someone out there who is at the brink of giving up. Satan is luring him out. God is not faithful. This God is too slow. <laughs> I will rather stay with a slow God than move with a fast devil. I will rather stay with a slow God than move with a fast devil. If you are free this afternoon, tune in to 32fm.com.ng for my radio broadcast today as we glorify and honor God. If you are not born again and you are here listening to me, please repeat these words after me. You don't have to be shy. Jesus loves you. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that I am a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross and you rose on the third day. Come and save my soul. Come and wash away all my sins with your blood. Give me the gifts of your righteousness. Come and draft me into your kingdom. From today, I am born again. If you have said those words sincerely and truthfully, you are now a member of this kingdom. I want you to find a Bible-believing church, offline or online. <laughs> And look for a Bible as well. Start from John chapter 1 and start to grow and read. Pray to your father. 
Your father who sees you in the secret will reward you openly. And if you are in Christ actually, and you know you have actually, you have derailed, your love for God is weak. Jesus was asking Peter, he said, lovest thou me more than this. You now love money. You love cars. You love houses. You love those things more than Jesus. You know that you love them. Because when Jesus is presented and those things are presented, you rather choose those things and leave Jesus. Jesus wants your love. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. Ask the Lord to help you, to help you, to strengthen you, to come back to him. Let ask God to restore your first love for him in your heart. That the fire of love will start to burn, burn, burn in your heart. Father, I ask that you will lay your hands on your children, wherever they are. If cloven tongues of fire can drop on the believers when they were gathered, Lord, let cloven tongues of fresh love drop on your children and insatiable love for God and insatiable love for righteousness and insatiable love for prayers for the world and for doing your will let it become our portion today Lord in the name of Jesus if you are sick in any part of your body father in the name of Jesus if there's anyone listening to me here and they have any sickness in any part of your body Lord I ask that you stretch your heart there is no distance in the realm of the spirit Every pain and disease and sickness that you may be carrying, I rebuke them now in the name of Jesus. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. And if you are listening to me and you have a very serious need, something that is burning you, I agree with you in the name above every other name, the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask that you will surprise your daughter and your sons this week in the name of Jesus, that by this time next Sunday, they will have a testimony. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for doing it. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Thank you, everyone. I see you on Sunday, probably, or during the week. Thank you for the time we have spent together. Thank you, Pastor Ajibade. Thank you, Sister Buki, Sister Bina, everyone, Mommy Duni, everyone. God bless you all. Sister Remy, thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. I see you next week on Sunday by the grace of God. Blessings to you all.